Welcome back. I'm Pastor Chris Titus, and uh, we're thankful that you're taking a look at the Armada Methodist YouTube page. Uh, today, we're going to return to our conversation about what scripture passage, what parts of God's Word can help us navigate some of the difficulties that we have in our lives. Uh, passages where God may be trying to direct us or give us some instruction uh, about how to deal with uh, different things. Uh, of course, God's Word gives us hints and indications as to His nature, His love for us, um, His protection, and then His willingness to be with us when things are difficult in our lives, um, especially the rescues that He gives us when things look rather hopeless. Of course, the ultimate rescue is our rescue from sin, uh, the biggest human problem that there is, and God uh, sends rescue through a relationship with Jesus Christ. But we also have other issues that happen in our lives, some turmoil and trouble that comes along, uh, unfortunately. So we need to understand that the Bible is there not only to teach us about God and, and lay out God's plan of salvation through Jesus, but also to provide instruction and help uh, when things are difficult in this world. Um, I said last week that God often provides us rescues, and in doing so, others around us are able to see His love, His mercy, His grace. And sometimes that echoes on for generations. We gave the example uh, last Sunday of Paul's shipwreck on the island of Malta. He's marooned there for three months. While he's there, he's preaching the gospel, and ultimately the Maltese people come to know Jesus because of those circumstances. So it's, it's about Paul's shipwreck, but yet other people are impacted positively because of that. Paul's misfortunes, uh, restored later by God, leads others to be saved. And my point here is that sometimes we get so focused on our own problems and what God may be trying to help us with, uh, with regard to those, that we don't realize that other people are noticing in our words, actions, and attitudes, uh, how much uh, God loves us and how they might also want to be in relationship with Jesus Christ. Other people witness what God is doing for us because we are willing to step out and share that with them. This is why God's grace is so amazing, and we should never think of His rescues or His help in our times of trouble as isolated events. Usually there's much more happening there, and we, we miss it. And so Paul's example is, it's about Paul's shipwreck, but ultimately it's about saving an entire island of people who come to know Jesus, and generations and generations thereafter to this day, uh, it is a Christian nation. So let's go back to Paul. When we last left him, he was in Rome. He was under house arrest, uh, living in a rental home with a guard, and he was uh, entertaining uh, visitors and teaching about Jesus. And this special position is provided to him. That's not something normally a prisoner would have, but God has set him up uh, in that uh, circumstance so that Jesus could be taught, so that the Roman people would have a much more uh, developed theology because of that. Now, there will come a time when that changes. And when we come to learn that Paul is going to be in more distress and, and be incarcerated in an actual prison. Uh, but Paul is teaching during that time about being really witnessing for Christ, but also like being an ambassador for Christ in the world. Letting people know um, that even though he had struggles, he has hope. And that's a pretty strong message, especially in a world that is often... Uh, seemingly hopeless. We too are called to witness Christ to others. And really what it comes down to is, as believers, we have to ask this question of ourselves often, um, how do I share my God story with other people? How does that come up in conversation? You'd be surprised how much joy people can experience by hearing that there was a time in our lives when things were tough, we relied on God, we trusted God, and we got through those circumstances. 
that's a pretty powerful story to tell somebody who might themselves be going through a difficulty. And so today, I want to talk about the joy that comes from that uh, a little bit more. So, back to Paul, chapter 28, the last chapter of the book of Acts. Uh, we need to learn what happened. And, and it really kind of is a cliffhanger. It just leaves us. Uh, Paul's in Rome. He's awaiting trial. And boom, that book comes to an end. So the question becomes, what happened after that? What after Paul was in Rome and he's there for several years preaching the gospel, uh, what occurred? Well, there isn't really a precise way of explaining that. And so we have to cobble together, piece together some information. It comes from uh, Paul's own writings, and it also comes from uh, church history that was surrounding um, the uh, Christian movement at the time that's outside the Bible. But primarily, we'll use Paul's words to learn of his fate. And so most scholars believe that after several years of a light confinement, he is ultimately removed from his rental home and guard and placed in prison. And now things are much more dire, and his treatment is much harsher. Yet, while he's in prison there in Rome, he is writing encouraging letters to others. And there are, these are sometimes called the uh, prison epistles. So let's go back to our Bible. We look at it like a bookcase. The letters section of the New Testament, which is shown here in blue, uh, there are 13 correspondence by Paul, along with some by Peter and John, uh, one by Jude. There's also a letter called Hebrews. Some scholars believe that Paul actually wrote Hebrews as well. Uh, the evidence of that authorship is unclear, and so we usually say that the author of Hebrews is unknown. But regardless, the letter's shelf is the largest collection of books in the Bible. It represents 21 of the 66 books that appear in our scripture. And so the purpose of those letters has been used to help us understand our theology, help us realize what God expects from us as, as believers, how we are to live in the world. And today I want to look at one of those letters, which is called Philippians. And Philippians is a prison letter because Paul is, again, he's incarcerated in Rome, now in a, in a jail cell. And He's writing to this church in Philippi that he founded. Uh, Philippi is located in norm, uh, northern Greece. And we have to imagine that the folks back in Philippi have heard the rumors that Paul is in jail and he's being charged with something that could lead to his execution. And so they're, they know about his harsh punishment. So when somebody tells them, you've got mail from Paul, you kind of wonder whether they thought to themselves, you know, it's going to be a letter describing all his woes and problems and complaints. I mean, after all, that's kind of how the world works, right? Sometimes we get a call on our phone or a text and we look down and we see the person who's calling or texting and we know that they're likely going to talk about and complain about their circumstances or we'll see their posts on social media and think, you know, oh boy, this is one of those how bad is the situation uh, talks that I'm going to have with them. So it's reasonable to think that the Philippian church may have thought the same thing when they first initially received this letter from Paul. And I think it's important to understand that when God is directing the mail, it isn't like what happens in the world around us. And that is definitely true of Paul's letter. This letter is actually very encouraging to the church in Philippi, despite the fact that Paul is sitting in a jail cell. So let's take a look at Philippians 1, beginning in verse 3. Paul says to the church, I thank God every time I remember you, and I always pray for all of you with joy. I thank God for the help you gave me while I told people the good news. You helped me from the first day you believed until now. I am sure that the good work of God began in you will continue until he completes it on the day when Jesus Christ comes again. Verse 12, brothers and sisters, I want you to know that all that has happened to me has helped to spread the good news. 
all the Roman guards and all the others here know that I am in prison for serving Christ. My being in prison has caused most of the believers to put their trust in the Lord and to show more courage in telling people God's message. So, we have to remember that this letter of Paul to the Philippians arrives during a very tough time in his life. There's no more comfortable rental home. He's no longer entertaining guests. Uh, scholars believe he is likely shackled to other prisoners or shackled directly to a wall. And so this is very harsh punishment. He's awaiting trial, which could result either in his freedom or his execution. So there's a lot on the line, a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety. Yet here's Paul writing that he has joy in his life every time he thinks about the strong belief of those in the Philippians church, even telling them him, even telling them that he is in jail because he has been preaching Christ and others have come to know about the Lord even the Roman guards and the others who are there, which we can assume are probably fellow prisoners, uh, because he has continued to preach despite his circumstances. This joyful letter is sent during a time of deep difficulty for Paul, yet when you read it, you wouldn't get that impression. And as believers, we have to think about the fact that when we have struggle, we can still extend joy to others so that they see God working in our lives despite our difficulties. And maybe it's even those people who are around, are around us who are causing us the problems, our captors, our, our folks who are causing us pain and discomfort. Maybe they will see Jesus because of the way we respond or, or folks who are experiencing troubles themselves may see how we are dealing with it with hope and trust and faith in God and they may be drawn to do the same. So what about us? Can we pull this off when things are so bad? Can we still extend joy and encouragement to others? The question is probably best answered, it depends. It really comes down to what we're focused on. If we're focused on our problems, our finances, our relationships, our health, our work, whatever it may be where the struggle is, is centered, if we're focused on that, it makes it much harder to extend joy or point people in the right direction as it relates to Jesus Christ. Um, we tend to talk about our problems because that's what we're focused on. That's what we're posting on social media. That's what we're texting and talking to our friends about. And this focus ultimately does nothing to draw people to God or to maybe even have them ponder a relationship with Jesus Christ. People can't see our joy, our connection to Christ when our focus is misplaced when it is directed primarily at our problems. And, you know, we have to ask the question, why does this happen? Well, it's because that's kind of how the world trains us. That's the way the world handles the struggle. Rich, poor, common man, politician, complaining and airing your grievances. What happened to you? Who did it? Why it was so unfair is the me-focused culture we live in. And it has nothing to do with sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's all about me. It's all about my problems and, and the complaining and, and uh, ruminating I'm doing over those issues. Now, that's the way the world deals with things. Now let's look at it from a God-focused point of view. I'm really saying, if, if I have that, that outlook, yes, I have problems, but I'm not handling those alone. I'm trusting in God. I have faith in Jesus Christ, and therefore I'll be able to navigate through whatever this difficulty is. When folks hear that, they hear God. When folks see that in our words, actions, and attitudes, they see God. And just like the people in Philippi, they hear joy despite the fact they know Paul is in prison. The hope of Jesus shown in the difficulties of our lives is what really is 
the greatest form of witnessing. When people know your difficulties, when they understand your chains, God is put at the forefront. When we have a God focus during those times, people notice and they receive that joy. And they begin to think, I want that hope. I want that faith. I want that trust. A God-focused view of our circumstances is a way of sharing our faith. Now, people might say, but pastor, that's like really hard to do. Yes, it is. It's very difficult to do. But sometimes the journey of our difficulty is less about us and more about what God is going to do and orchestrate through our challenge for other people. Remember, we go back to Paul, he gets marooned on an island. You know, that's a bad situation for him. And then all of a sudden, all of these people are coming to know Jesus because they came to know Paul because of his misfortunes. And so we have to resign ourselves to serve God and to do so even when our life is challenging. Football fans will remember a great player, a great NFL player named Gail Sayers. And when he was in college, he noticed a sign on his coach's desk and the sign said, I am third. So he was curious and he asked his coach, what, what does that mean? And the coach replied, the Lord is first, my friends and family are second, and I am third. Years later, Sayers hit the big time in the NFL. In fact, he scored six touchdowns in one game, still a record to this day. And later on, he had a medallion made that said, I am third. Despite his stardom, he didn't lose focus on God. And the same is true for us. When we keep our focus on the Lord, when we uh, continue to read scripture and pray and reflect in our behavior that we trust God, people will see Jesus in our words, actions, and attitudes. And when we place ourselves third, many are blessed including us. And Paul wrote about this. He, I mean, he said, it's good that I'm in jail so that others can find Jesus. Now that's a I am third way of looking at things. So what mail can God deliver through you? We talked about it last week, how important it is to witness and share our faith with other people. All this really means is that we are telling people how God has rescued us, how God has got us through a difficulty, or how he is currently helping us with some challenge that we have in our life. And people can see hope in that. Paul writes about this in Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. He says, Do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you will be blameless and pure, children of God without fault. But you are living with e evil people all around you who have lost their sense of what is right. Among those people, you shine like lights in a dark world and you offer them the teaching that gives life so that I can be proud of you when Christ comes again. You will show that my work was not wasted and that I ran in the race and won. Verse 17, your faith makes you give your lives as a sacrifice in serving God. Maybe I will have to offer my own life with your sacrifice. But if that happens, I will be glad and I will share my joy with all of you. You also shall be glad and share your joy with me. So Paul is writing this to the church in Philippi and for our benefit as well, saying, Things may get tough in life. There may be heartache. There may be sacrifice. But you are to serve the Lord. So for myself as a believer and for you, we need to find ways, whether things are good or bad, we need to find ways to let other people know of God's love. Life is a race. So let's run it for Jesus. Let's not do so in selfishness with a me focused. Stay focused on God even when our problems are overwhelming. And Paul shares with his friends in Philippi 
that he hopes that working this way, serving Christ, will matter in the end in his life. So that was his mail to deliver for Jesus. What good news correspondence can you send? Can you bring to someone else? Paul is evangelizing to this church in northern Greece that he really wasn't supposed to go to. In fact, he was going to go to Asia. But the Holy Spirit directed him uh, to go to Macedonia, where Philippi is located. And because of that, Paul brought the mail, the good news of Jesus Christ, and that nation was saved as well, a region that was far west than Paul had journeyed before. But we need to understand this. God will use our journey to share his plan of salvation with other people. The mail needs to get delivered. Whatever direction it's sent by God through us or whoever we may need to share that with. We will all experience this challenging world around us with all kinds of troubles, but we need to understand that God will work through our circumstances even when they are difficult. When we find ourselves in a tough spot, maybe we need to look at it a little bit differently. Maybe ask the question, what amazing thing will God bring out of this current trouble that I have? And if we start looking around, we'll start noticing maybe what he is actually doing beyond our problems. How can we share the love of God with other people who are hurting? God's savings, saving grace, the salvation, this being saved through Jesus Christ, that message has to be shared. And, a deliv and de delivering God's mail is a priority for a believer just as Paul's encouraging letter to Philippi was sent, even though his situation found him in jail. Let's take advantage of the opportunities to tell other people what God means to us. Let's share that message. Let's deliver that mail. Amen? There'll be a video attached right down here. It talks about the importance of being in church and how as a community uh, we can find more joy together. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you listen to it. Till the next time we gather, be blessed.